I'm Dara Harris. I'm the director of school counseling at Stonewall Jackson High School. I know I have other two, two other people here, but they got snowed in, so it's just a one-man band today. So I apologize that they're not here, but nonetheless, we will have a great conversation around HBCUs. How many people in here went to an HBCU? Oh, perfect. So feel free to chime in with your experiences, because this is a conversation. It's not me talking at you, OK? And you can ask questions as we go along as well, all right? All right, so what is an historically black college or university? So prior to 1964, any institution that was designed for black Americans to have some options at post-secondary education were called historically black colleges and universities, OK? So that was, like I said, prior to 1964, which is Brown versus Wade, which is when things were separate but equal. Nowadays, things have changed, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But that is the main caveat behind a historically black college, is that it was established before 1964, with the primary focus of educating black Americans. Today, HBCUs are public, private, and they also offer medical and law schools as well. Okay, So this is not one of the types of organizations where you can only get an undergraduate degree. You can get graduate degrees as well and specialty um, education. There are 108 HBCUs across the United States. HBCUs award the highest amount of baccalaureate and graduate degrees to date, meaning that people start and people finish. Because that's really important. That's not something that's particular or uh, specific to HBCUs, but that's also something that's important just in general in college. Who starts and who finishes? Okay. Alumni networks. HBCUs have one of the strongest alumni networks that you could um, know out there. And I'm sure those of you who went to HBCUs here in the um, class could tell us about some of the wonderful opportunities you all have through your alumni networks. And lastly, it's equal access to all. As I stated before, HBCUs were founded on the premise of educating black Americans, but today it is equal access to all. You can go to many campuses across the world and you will find students of color and not on campus, OK? So this is just a montage of the various HBCUs that are out there. If you went to one, hopefully you see yours. And if not, um, just know that we're thinking of you and you're there, OK? We're going to talk a little bit about what Prince William County Schools does to make sure that students have access to information as it pertains to HBCUs. You can't see this, and if I had my wonderful co-worker with me, you'd have this handout. But it is in the presentation on page 19 of the Prince William County course catalog. That's the 16-17 school year course catalog. You can find a listing of all the HBCUs. Okay, I know you use that information because you're so busy trying to get your classes and graduation requirements, but we do have post-secondary information in that catalog as well. So on page 19 of the 1617 course catalog, you will find a listing of HBCUs. You'll also find a listing of schools that are 50% um, Hispanic, as well as a listing of Virginia public and private four-year institutions. Okay? All right. So here's the 2017 U.S. News World uh, Report ranking of HBCUs. There are only nine listed, but we have a tie. Number four, Morehouse and Tuskegee University are a tie. Okay, so this is a listing of the various rankings amongst the HBCUs. I'm going to say this now because everybody asks. Clapton, U Clapton University is in South Carolina, Orangeburg, South Carolina. Any questions about the ranking? Spelman College is number one, but you know, more females are going these days to college, so that might explain why it might be number one. All right? All right, and this is just a listing of famous uh, alumni from various uh, um, HBCUs around the world, around the country, I'm sorry. Tom Joyner, you always hear him talk about it on uh, his, his morning show, Tuskegee University. Everybody knows Tom Joyner went to Tuskegee. You have Thurgood Marshall. He was a Howard University graduate. You have L. Douglas Wilder, went to Virginia Union University. And they also have a library named after him at this particular point in time. Oprah Winfrey, we got Tennessee State University. Spike Lee is a Morehouse man. 
Taraji P. Henson from Empire, as you all know, is a Howard University grad right here in D.C. We have uh, Erica Badu. She went to Gramlin, as well as Jerry Rice, Mississippi Valley State. Okay? So this just tells you that there are prominent figures out there who are graduates of HBCUs, and so you, too, could have an opportunity to be amongst the wall of stars if you should choose to go that route. Benefits of attending HBCU. If you know anybody who went to an HBCU, you know that there is a strong legacy. Their grandmother went, their mama went, their uncle went, everybody in their family went to an HBCU. A lot of times it's the same school, but not always, okay? Sometimes that's just a legacy within the family. And so that's what is um, very unique about HBCUs is that it's, it has a long historic um, legacy. A nurturing environment. You all know your students. And sometimes, you know, they might be an only child or they might be um, needing a little bit more assistance than most. And HBCUs offer a nurturing environment like no other. They have an extended family, I like to call it. You know, you're an only child, you're leaving your mom, you can find a mama on a campus of an HBCU. You can find one, an auntie or anyone. You, and it's not one of those things where, you know, they're just advising you, but they're also helping you get through life lessons and experiences. And that's very unique to an HBCU. Professors versus teaching assistants, okay? A lot of times uh, the uh, professors are full professors, meaning they have a degree and they have published work, and they're not just teaching assistants. And while, you know, this is something that's unique to HBCUs, just in general, I don't care what school you apply to, that's always something to think about. Do you have graduate assistants who are learning about the subject teaching your class, or do you have full professors teaching the class? They have smaller class sizes, specialized courses and in extracurricular activities that are focused towards minority students, okay? Um, if you've gone to other campuses, um, I went to William & Mary, and while we had um, various different types of extracurricular activities and courses, um, we designed that ourselves. We had a student union, and we designed it ourselves. But at HBCUs, you'll find more programs and extracurricular activities that are focused towards minority students. Empowerment, a confidence like you would not believe. A confidence like you would not believe. And you know what? It's not one of those things that they just got because they walked on the campus, but it is embedded into the curriculum, you know? Students arrive that freshman year, they are in that auditorium, and they are pumping that pride into them like you would not believe. I always tell the story of how um, I have a girlfriend who went to Hampton, and I went to William & Mary, and I remember going to visit her and going on her campus, and I was like, my goodness, what? I mean, it's just, it's just this pride that they have that you just would not believe. And um, kind of envious that a little bit. But at the end of the day, um, that is, you know, that is something to be very proud of and very prideful about. So they have a strong, empowering network that just, you know, helps the students get through it and get out there and continue that legacy on past graduation. Again, I talk about alumni associations, you know looking out for one another. You see the student or a friend who went to Norfolk State, you know, the opportunity there and, and to say, you know, oh, I'm going to help my, my fellow alum is always there in any school for the most part, but especially for HBCUs. And lastly, financial aid opportunities. I know sometimes people look at the price tag and they think, oh, my goodness, I cannot afford $40,000, $30,000 to go to some of these schools. But there are financial aid opportunities that are specific to students applying to HBCUs and minority students. And I want you to know that if you're applying to an HBCU as a white female, you are considered a minority student. So there are financial aid opportunities for you at, this univer at the various universities. Okay? Any questions about the benefits? All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about the reported disadvantages. And this is reported from students and parents, so this is not my personal perception, okay? The cost of tuition. Like I said, previously, uh, you look at these schools, I know people have said, I'm not paying $45,000 to go to a school for one year. But as I stated before, financial aid opportunities are like no other. They do have various different um, grants and scholarships that are for students who are applying to HBCU. In Virginia, a lot of the, um, we have a, quite a few private HBCUs. So we have what's called the Virginia VTAG Assistance, which is Virginia um, Tuition Assistance Grant that is specific for students applying to private schools. 
and that would also qualify for an HBCU. Okay? So don't look at the price tag and knock it. I'm telling you now, apply, do your homework, and maybe, you know, sometimes the cost of tuition for a private school can be cheaper than that of a public school once it's all said and done. Once that award letter's there, once you have those grants and scholarships in, it can be cheaper. Okay? Public perception. Believe it or not, despite the fact that, you know, all schools are created equal, some people perceive that attending an HBCU is not as um, competitive as some of the other schools. And as you can see from that list of, I had of alumni previously, that's not true, okay? It's all in what you make it. There are strong network opportunities and strong opportunities to get various different types of jobs by going to an HBCU. I always say that, you know, um, when companies are looking for students and they want, they're looking for minority students, they will target their, their um, recruitment at HBCUs. So if that was indeed the case, I don't think they'd be there. So think about that. Funding. Um, sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to sustain the funding um, at the various different HBCUs, which impacts campus amenities. All right? So maybe the living quarters are not like they would be at another school, a public university. Maybe they're not, they're, they don't have sushi on the menu. You know, and some schools do have sushi. That's why students are gaining so much weight now. <laughs> I'm just being honest. They have some really good food and menus on these campuses. So, yes, you know, um, that is something to think about. So it's important that you get out and you visit and you make sure that you're making um, the right decision for yourself. But I do want you to understand that there are some perceptions and some disadvantages that have been reported by students and parents that you sh should be aware of, okay? Any questions about any of this information? All right, so what do we do here in Prince William County to ensure that you are aware of the resources if you plan to attend an HBCU? First, as I said before, the ca course catalog on page 19 lists the various different um, schools. So you have a start there of knowing what's out there. We have a bus tour that is really um, specific for Prince William County students. One of the directors at Freedom High School, um, is this, she spearheads this project, uh, Brianna Moore. She used to be at Potomac High School. And this is one of her things that are near and dear to heart. So she takes an actual bus tour, usually during spring break, um, where they go and they visit various different schools. And she ensures that HBCUs are on the list of schools to visit. So if you are interested in it and you don't hear about it, you know I already gave you the contact person, because she's at Freedom High School, but you can go to any of the very school websites and find this information, okay? Uh, scholarships. A lot of the uh, fraternities and sororities that, are, um, that have chapters here in the Prince William area will send us information. Omega Sci Fi just sent us, a, I guess, a scholarship maybe two or three days ago that is specific to Prince William students, and so that is another very, uh, opportunity for you to get um, money to attend a HBCU that's here in Prince William County School. Yep, it's on the school's website, okay. Um, T.C. Williams has a college fair, and we take buses to T.C. Williams of students to attend that fair. We also go to Alfred Street Baptist Church. They have a, a college fair there. If you're familiar with that, it's one of the most prominent um, African-American churches in the Alexandria area. And then Vermont Avenue Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., we take students there as well for the UNCF Black College Career Day. And then lastly, on-site admission opportunities. Um, some of the schools will actually come to the campus and do on-site admissions right there, meaning that you can, we'll, a student will come, we'll give them their transcript, they'll have their application, they'll have their test scores, they meet right there with the admissions representative, and they can make them an offer right there on the spot. Hampton University does that a lot. Um, and they're one of the more prominent schools that come to us to um, do that type of admissions um, opportunity. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So great opportunities, an opportunity to get that task done in advance, so if that's something that you're looking at, you know, you can always go to the various websites and see when this information is advertised, who will be there, and whether or not they'll have those opportunities there, okay? 
Any other questions about what we do here in Prince William County to ensure that students are aware of opportunities at HBCUs? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, they have the, you know, the, the, the tours that they kind of do every day, but they also have overnight opportunities where they will, summer programs where they will link you with various students, maybe even sometimes from your area, you know. I always, you know, say that you got to get out and visit. You can't just step on a campus and say, I want to be around a bunch of people, and then you don't really know what that experience is going to be like. You have to visit. And if you know of someone, maybe let's say you're, you know, from, from the country, and that's just not your thing, you know, you've never really been in a, in a school that's more in a metropolitan area, then you need to get out and visit. You need to experience that, um, have that experience so that you can make a good decision about whether or not this is the best place for you. Because you are spending like twenty, thirty thousand $30,000, people. You kind of want to make sure that you have done your research and that this is the best place for you. That's a good thing to think about. And also, if you're not sure about how to go about and find out about some of these opportunities, summer opportunities, you can call the schools or you can visit their website. The information is not restricted to people who are just applying now. So if you have a ninth grader, if you have a, you know, a 10th grader, you can start doing some of this research now and looking at this information to ensure that you're prepared when time comes to start applying to the various different schools. Okay, good, good comments. All right, so these are various different college fairs that are out and about um, throughout the metropolitan area and throughout the U.S. 2017 Alpha Street Baptist Street um, College Fair is going to happen on February 18th. Malcolm Bernard Historical Black College Week, they are a group of recruiters that travel, okay? So you can go to their website, and it is there, and it's in your handout, and you can find out where they're going to be, and if you're on spring break or on vacation, you can go to the fair that's in that area, all right? The same is true of the annual HBCU College Fair presented by McDonald's. Also, the Black College Expo Tour, they too are a traveling group of admissions officers. So if you're on spring break and you're in Florida and they're going to be at a local school, you can go to that fair. It's free. It's not, it doesn't even cost you anything. Um, college Board has a Dream Deferred HBCU College Fair that they offer. And then the MEAC, I don't know if you're familiar with the MEAC, but it's the Mid-Eastern Athletic College um, Conference. And they are a group of schools that compete amongst each other for various different sports. They have their own fair that you can attend. Okay. I believe they now have a fair in the Maryland area. They used to be in Richmond, which is a little closer for you, but now they have one in the Maryland area. Okay. So you could just research and get out there. Like I said, this stuff is free. It's open. It's not anything that you have to you know, know someone to get this information. Um, check the school's websites. I'm telling you that. I mean, I'll be honest, Prince William County, we just got our website up and going, and sometimes it doesn't work, but other people have one, right? And it's not secretive. You don't have to put a password in to get this information. And if you see something that you feel like you want to know more about, then you just ask your school counselor. They'll tell, tell you about it. Yes, ma'am. This one is hbcu-cnfj.com. Uh, hbcu-cnfj.com. Then you have the College Expo org and dream deferred dot college board if you put in dream deferred if you google that it'll come up because it has some other um, various different uh, characters in there and then the MEAC you can just go to the just google MEAC and it'll it'll come up that way but if you're let's say you're going spring break you're going to go to uh, Williamsburg oh my goodness do you know how many schools are up and down that area that you can visit um, just in that one, you know, in, in a three-day time frame. So don't be afraid to, like, when you're out on your family vacations or you're doing various different things, to visit some of these schools. Yes, sir. You could go any, there for anybody. You have a ninth grader. <laughs> you can take them to the college fair. And the reason why you need to start early is because there's so many schools with so many different things, and I know your students don't know what they want to do with their life. So this will give them access. You've got to start narrowing down that information. The college fair that's in Prince William County that we have, anybody can go to that fair. Yeah. So start early. And if, you're a, if you have a junior, you definitely need to be attending some of these fairs. Okay? All right. Here's a listing of the HBCU grant and scholarship opportunities. 
Um, you can Google any of these uh, various different organizations and they give information about, and it's in your handout. Alumni scholarships, I put that there because various different um, alumni have their own scholarships that they offer. Tom Joyner, he talks about his all the time. I don't care what radio station you listen to, I'm sure you heard of Tom Joyner's scholarship um, for um, HBCUs, okay? And like I said, this is not information that is for one particular school or person. Anybody can apply to these if you fit the criteria. And then lastly, the HBCU application process. Um, EDU, EDU Inc. offers a common black college application. So for $35, you can apply to 49 different HBCUs at one time, okay? And you can either Google EDU Inc. or common black college application. And like I said, for $35, 49 schools. That's a great deal considering Sometimes one school can be $35, okay? Now some people think, oh, well, what about the common application? Well, remember they're membership to these organizations. So all schools are not members of all organizations. So you're, all of the school, all of the HBCUs are not members of the common black college application, okay? All of the schools are not members of the common application. So you gotta be mindful of that. If they're in that listing of schools, then you can do it for one fee. And that's definitely something to think about take advantage of. Get Educated is another uh, website. The HBCU All-Star Program application is a White House initiative that was started by uh, President o Obama in helping students to get into HBCU. So they have ambassadors from various different schools who go around and recruit to kind of help with the admissions process and getting students um, on the campus to see the university or the college to figure out whether or not that's somewhere they want to go. And so the application is closed for 2016. I don't know if there will be a 2017, but at this time, it's definitely worth investigating to see what kind of opportunities they offer for you to visit and to meet people who went to some of the HBCUs. And then lastly are the HBCU websites. You can go to the various websites now and look at the requirements and the things that they're asking of you to see if you meet the criteria to be admitted to that school. Any questions about this process? Um, maybe it jogs some other questions about applying to college in general, um, financial aid. What questions do you have of me about um, HBCUs? Or like I said, college in general. Are you all shy because they, oh, okay, video on. I was gonna say, don't be shy people. I can't be the only people talking. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, so the individual education plans that are designed in high school can be taken to the various different colleges. And for the most part, colleges do honor what is in them. The, the caveat to that is that your student is now an adult. So they have to be able to navigate that process and tell someone on the campus that they have that particular need so that they can get the assistance that they have. But most schools have because a lot of the things that they're getting accommodations are federal um, accommodations and they have to honor those. Not to say they'll do everything that's in an IEP, but they will do some sort of accommodation to kind of assist with that learning process. But the student, has, the student has to advocate and let them know that they have that, okay? That's a very important question, yes, but they do exist. And with that being said, because another parent asked this, so I'm going to just throw out some things to y'all to say. Um, she said, well, you know, should I be calling the counselor to talk to them about that? And I said, yes and no. Yes, because you have questions. And as a parent, you're entitled. You're about to pay this money. You should know what you're getting yourself into. But no in a sense of, you know, you, the student has to be able to navigate that process on their own, okay? So if we do all the work, you and I as a parent, and the student is not involved in it, and then they go to their sophomore year, and they have to do the FAFSA, and they have to ask questions, and they have to present someone with their IEP. Are they really going to know how to do that if they weren't involved in it from day one? So what I like to tell parents to do is this. You get a list of questions. You give it to the student. You send them in there, because they're in the building with us anyway, right? So they can just ask this themselves. If something doesn't sound right, then you pick up the phone and you call us. Or you can send us an email and say, hey, 
I'm just sending my student in there. They're going to ask you a couple of questions. Can you help them out? And we'll already be on the same page. And so we're helping them to understand that I need to be an advocate for myself. I'm understanding what I'm asking. And I'm also responsible for taking information that I learned back to someone else. And then when they get to their sophomore year and they have to do the FAFSA and fill out college, you know, applications for scholarships and grants, they'll have that experience and they'll know what to do. But if we do all the work, then who's going to do the work later? And the sad thing about it is when you go to college is that you treat it as an adult. So granted, you're writing the check. The college is going to communicate with the student. So you may not have that ability to talk to them um, when you get there. So remember that. But those are, that's a very good question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Exactly. Remember that. We have Naviance in the county, right? So Naviance allows you an opportunity to kind of have a one-stop shop to get to various different college applications, as well as the common application. But you're right. Schools have various requirements. So you need to make sure that you're following the various requirements for that school. Meaning if they're saying take the SAT or the ACT, you've done that. If there's a subject test that goes along with it, you've done that part. Maybe they're requiring an essay and the other schools are not. You have to make sure you do all of the requirements of the entire process, okay? And to help with that, I'm gonna give you a helpful tip. So, if you have a junior, you've, you've been doing your thing, and now it's time to buckle down and get started, okay? So, they need to be taking the test, the ACT, SAT, whatever test they're gonna take, they need to be taking that in the spring, right? Because now they've learned everything they need to know to take those tests. If you can get that last test done by June, done. That requirement is out of the way. So if anybody asks for a score, you should have a score by the summer, okay? So now you, you're going to get out and visit. Hopefully you went a couple places over spring break, but you're going to spend your summer doing that last minute shopping. You're going to go visit a couple of schools, maybe participate in a program or two, and narrow down that um, list of colleges that you're going to apply to. Because as I said, the common application, the black application is $35, 49 schools. Most schools are $39 to $50 to $100 per application. So you can't do like 20 of them. All right? that, that's probably not a good thing to do. So you need to narrow that down. So you've done your visiting over spring break in the summer. You get back to school. You're applying. You're submitting those applications. Yes, the application isn't due to February 1, but I'm ahead of the game, and I'm going to submit my application in October, November, because I just want that out of the way. And you don't have to fight with your student to get it done, okay? Because you remember, they're in school. They're taking classes. They have sports. They have activities. The last thing they want to do is a common, an application or a personal statement. So if you all can make an agreement that you're going to get this done by this date, that'll save you a headache in the long run, okay? So you get that done early by, I would say, November, and now all you have to do is focus on money. Every day, two days a week, three days a week, I'm going to log on, I'm going to be on some of these websites, and I'm looking at scholarship and grant opportunities for my particular situation. And you can do that from, let's say, November, December, all the way to like February, March, April, up until the award letters are done, okay? And remember, the FAFSA, you used to have to do that after January 1. You can do that in October now. So you can get your tax return together. And you, know, you already got the testing done. You already have the application done. You can focus on the money. Because that is the hardest part of this process, in all honesty to me, is the money. Because now, when you get that award letter, May 1, from your school, you have to make a decision about where you're going to go. Okay? And if you have a $45 price tag, a $45,000 price tag, and you have $12,000 and $10,000 and $5,000 that can eat some of that up, you're better able to make a decision about where your final destination is going to go or going to be, okay? So if you can follow that timeline, your life will be easier and your student's life will be easier. But you've got to invest time into the money piece because that is a big part of this process as well, okay? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You go in there. So they have IES, uh, they have a particular um, like component to their program where they work with HBCU students to have that abroad process. 
So that's pretty pretty cool. You know, a lot of people don't take advantage of that, but you do know there are jobs in other countries, right? You don't have to just stay here. So you can take that and go in other places. I mean, I know as a student, I wish I had done that. You know, I wish I had gone abroad and looked at other opportunities. But then you now you understand that your playing field is way larger than just the U.S. Okay? So, yeah, so that's some of the opportunities that are out there. And you can take classes and sometimes while you're over there so you're not losing any credit. Okay? So think about that. Good question. Any other questions? Well, like I said, I just want you all to understand that, you know, it's important for us, for our students here in Prince William County to have um, all the information that they need to have. And while we do have um, various different college fairs for various different, you know, schools and places in Virginia, HBCUs are near and dear to us. We have a lot of graduates here in the county um, who went to HBCUs, and, and we want to make sure that students understand that this is an important part of the college application process options, okay? No other questions? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. You're the student. You can ask as many questions as you'd like. Okay, so I'm a history of mine. Okay. Probably not, because most of the time they're doing it in the year that they're recruiting, okay? so. There's a, there's a science to it all. How many students am I getting in state, out of state? How many students am I getting from a particular region, okay? So normally when they come to do on-site admissions, they have a set amount of seats and a set amount of students that they can accept from that particular region, okay? So in your year, it may be five, it may be 20, okay? But you have to wait to that particular year to see that. If you want to know what you're up against requirement-wise, you can go to the various websites of the schools and look at the profile of the incoming class. That tells you a lot of what you need to know, whether or not you even stand a chance. And we tell students to do this. A lot of times they'll say, my counselor told me I can never go there. That's not what we're saying to you. We're saying that based on the profile of the class before you, you know, you have some requirements that are in the ballpark, some that may not be in the ballpark. So it might be a, a check mark and you shouldn't have any problem getting into that school, or it may be that maybe your GPA is lower than the average mean of the students who were admitted the year before you. So you might want to make sure your SAT scores or your AT, ACT scores are up because that might be an issue for you. So if you want to know that, then you can just go to the various schools' websites that you're thinking about and look at their school profiles, and they can tell you. It can tell you how many students they accepted from Virginia, how many they accepted out of state. Um, that's really important because it's giving you some idea of what your competition is, you see. I think sometimes you think about what's here in your school, and it's way bigger than that, way bigger than that, you know. Maybe this is the year of the, the, the STEM, and they're looking for females who are in math and science, okay, and you don't fit the profile this year, you know. So you have to understand what the school is trying to do in order to make the best decision for yourself because they're communities. And they're trying to build a little community of people that they feel are going to get in and get out. Okay? Good question. Exactly. Remember, it's a mean. There are people to, on the left and the right. Okay? There are people who are higher than that average. There are people who are below that average. And you need to know that. The one good thing about using Naviance in Prince William County is that we're able to gather information from various students. So if I know I sent 10 students from Stonewall Jackson to um, Hampton University, I can look at the profiles of those students to say, this is also kind of based on what I could see from last year, the, the information they gathered from our students, and this is what your competition looks like on a smaller scale. So we can see that in schools because we're using that one program that captures all of that information, okay? So if you want to know, I mean, you all have hopefully have access to Naviance because you've used your student's account. And if not, you can just ask the counselor and they'll give you the password <laughs> to get in there. But you can find this information as well, all right? Yes, ma'am. Well, they're, if, if you're looking, she's not starting too early because you know what your competition is, you know? I think that that's important to understand. Like you. If you're looking now, you have some idea of what you need to be working towards. Do I need a 3.5? Do I need to be a junior? Should I have had this SAT? Should I be participating in this club, key club? 
doing a sport, having a job, should I be a leader? So it's giving you that information. Yes, they're going to be awarding that money in this year, probably to students who are closer to graduating. They're going to be looking more at juniors and sophomores. But at the same time, it's giving you intel on what you need to be doing at this particular point. You don't really have a GPA at ninth grade. You don't really have SAT scores or anything. So yes, you're not probably going to be competing with the right group of people. But it does tell you that information. And that's what we try to encourage parents to do. This is information that we talk to ninth graders about when we go into the classroom. Look now, because now you know what you need to be working towards, right? You can't wait till, and I say this, you know, GPA is like grapes in a basket. You can't have, you know, 20 grapes in here of mess and think one grape is going to tilt that scale and you're going to go from a 2.3 to a 3.5. It doesn't work that way. You have to be building a strong foundation. And if you know that they're expecting a 3.5, if you know that they're expecting you, know, you to have leadership, four years of experience in a particular club for a long period of time, you can start building your resume in that way. You see? So yes, those scholarship searches are great because they allow you to make a profile and then they feed you information based on your criteria. Like FastWeb is another one that most people know about. But there are others that are out there. And every year, you got to go in, you got to update it, you got to change it, put your right GPA in there, your profile, your work experience, your leadership experience, so that when it begins to filter more things, that you can get in the running for those particular scholarships and grants. So starting early is very good, but it is a full-time job. It is a full-time job. I know you don't want to do it every day, but <laughs> it is a full-time job, you know, because you're looking for money against everybody else in the world looking for money. Not the people at your school, not the people in your class, the world. You see what I'm saying? So you have to start thinking about that process very differently. Yes, <laughs> they would have all seen it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You can jump right on in. It's not to say that you can't do it, but it's just going to be tougher. And then you get that discouraged feeling that a lot of students have. You know, you're in your 10th grade year, you know, so sophomore year, you probably weren't doing as well. Your GPA from freshman year might have been like a 2.5, and you're seeing all these things that say 3.5. This is what you have to have. Can you still apply? Yes, because remember, it's an average. Everything is, you know, there are people to the left and right of that. At the end of the day, though, you still have to know that you're, you've kind of narrowed down a little bit of your options because of that particular thing, you know. Um, so no, it's not too late to start, but you might have to work harder. Maybe your path is going to be different. Maybe if I want to go to an HBCU or some other school, I have to go to community college first, get my grades up, and then transfer over. Okay? So it doesn't mean that you're out of the game. It just might be a different path for you. And that's okay, because at the end of the day, it's whether we finish. <laughs> right? Doesn't matter where we start, it's whether we finish. And nobody, when they see that degree on the wall, is going to know that in high school I messed up and I played around and I had to go to community college. The only thing they're going to see is that degree on the wall. So yeah, so it's never too late. Sometimes people don't have that epiphany till they're an adult. I mean, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. And it might be three kids later, and you know, I got to feed children and go to work and do these things. I mean, you know, it happens to the best of us, you know? Well, you can know what? Shoot the counselor email. Tell them the questions you want to have. And then they'll send for the student. Can you send for my student and talk to them about these things? And if that doesn't, if the message doesn't come home and they can't articulate it, be like, can we just set up an appointment and then take the student with you to the conference so that you all can hear the information? Because like I said, you can do it high school to college, but when they have to do it on their own, are they going to have the skills that they need to do that? And sometimes it's no, because it doesn't kick in until 25, 28, 30, you know? I mean, it's, for some people, it's just a late bloomer, you know? Yes, ma'am. I don't know, yeah, transferring. I don't know if, yeah, no, you know what? For some people, that's why they do the community college route, because it's cheaper. Remember, you, I mean, you're paying $400 per credit hour, sometimes even seven to $800 per credit hour, when you can pay $120, $30, $40 over here to get some of those requirements out of the way. So it's not a bad way of transferring over. And I don't ever want people to think that, because sometimes that's just the route you have to take. But the other side to that is that, one, you have to make sure you have an agreement. And while NOVA is here, there are 
probably 100 other college, community colleges on your way to a Hampton. So there's, in Richmond, there's J. Sergeant Reynolds. In Newport News, I can't remember the name of it, but John Tyler. You say what? Thompson, Thomas Nelson, there's John Tyler. So all of the areas have community colleges. So you might have to move to that area. You can go to the community college there to take advantage of the agreement that they have with Hampton. You see what I mean? Now, if you don't do that and you don't move, that's fine. Go to the community college. Call Hampton. This is what I'm trying to do, okay? This is what I'm going to take. What will and won't transfer? and get that in writing before you do it. Because if you don't have the agreement, I can't really say that they'll take what you've done. And that is true of any school. I don't care if you go from Hampton to Howard, if you go from Virginia Tech to George Mason, you get stuff in writing because colleges can do whatever they want. They don't have to take somebody else's credit, okay, unless there is an agreement in place. So if you go to Nova and then you want to transfer, you talk to admissions rep at Hampton, you say, figure out what you need. This is what I'm going to do. Can you guarantee me that this will transfer and I won't come in and have wasted all of my time? Okay? And remember, when you transfer, the requirements are different. Right? You're not, you're not judged as a, a, a student, K through 12. You're judged on your two years of transfer credits. So the requirements are going to be higher. All right? It might be 2.5 for a high school senior. It might be 3.5 for a college transferring student. Okay, so you have to make sure all of that's clear and spelled out before you do it. Otherwise, you will have wasted a lot of money, and you will be very angry. <laughs> and chances are you'll probably be working and not going to school because <laughs> you got to pay it back. I'm just being honest. Okay, yes, ma'am. And you know what's nice? Because when you go for that, they just love them up, and they're like, I can see myself here. I, I can, I can see, I can meet a friend. That's how. I mean, that's how I went. I was, I never. First child to go to college, never been away from home, sisters on both sides, never been anywhere by myself. But I went, I made a friend, and I was healed. Like, you know, I mean, you, I found myself <laughs> wanting to meet other people. So, yes, that is a very good way of getting them interested, is to take them to get that feel of the campus and experience that so they can say, you know, I can see, I can see myself here, you know? 